afternoon, brothers and sisters. As promised, a special session here, and you can see the description. I uh, got to get some things retaught, as we talked about on the last couple of weeks. And that's starting with chapter 7, part 39, which actually we, we realized we didn't finish. So we'll start here in a few. Alright, again, good afternoon uh, uh, here, Central Standard Time, it's 3.30 p.m. Uh, 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 in the afternoon. We won't be before you long, that's not the intent. We want to finish up Chapter 7, which we apologize in our haste and in our excitement to move to Chapter 8. We didn't finish the last few verses, so what I'm going to do is dip back in. Now, Chapter 7 videos are no longer on this channel. They have been moved to our YouTube page, and so please indulge us in chapter 7. Yes, it's already on YouTube, but we didn't get the last several verses covered, so we're going to do that on today. And essentially, we'll do it, we'll download it, and we'll upload it, to, and hopefully this works, because we've been having issues, and I haven't checked back with Facebook to see if they fixed it, but we're going to find out in probably 30 minutes to an hour or so if they fixed it, hopefully they have and we can get the rest of our videos downloaded and uploaded to YouTube. So, uh, uh, fingers crossed, prayers rendered, let's go. What I'm going to do is read that last pericope in chapter 7. We're not going to go all the way back to verse 25, but I want to read it just to kind of get us back into the context of what Paul is saying there, and then we'll drop down, I think, in verse 36, somewhere in there, and finish up to verse 40. So here's what it says. It's about the unmarried and widows. Verse 25. Now about virgins. I have no command from the Lord, but I do give an opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is faithful. Because of, this, of the present distress, that's why I want to read the context here, of the present distress, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Talking about being single, that's from the first 24 verses. Anyway, verse 27. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. In other words, if you're married. Are you released from a wife? Divorced or not married, do not seek a wife. However, if you do get married, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned, but such people will have trouble in this life, and I am trying to spare you. 29 says, this is what I mean, brothers and sisters. The time is limited. So from now on, those who have wives should be as those they had, those Sorry about that. Let's start at 29 over. This is what I mean, brothers and sisters. The time is limited. So from now on, those who have wives should be as though they had none. Though those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who busy, who buy, excuse me, as though they didn't own anything and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it. For this world in its current form is passing away. I want you to be without concerns. The unmarried man is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the married man is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife and his interests are divided. The unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord so that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But the married woman is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. I am saying this for your own benefit, not to put a restraint on you, 
but to promote what is proper and so that you may be devoted to the Lord without distraction. If any man thinks he is acting improperly toward the virgin he is engaged to, CSB, Christian Standard Bible, just wanted, I don't know if I threw that in, <clears throat> if she is getting beyond the usual age for marriage and he feels he should marry, he can do what he wants. He is not sinning. They can get married. But he who stands firm in his heart, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and has decided in his heart to keep her as a fiancé, will do well. So, then, he who marries his fiancé does well. But he who does not marry will do better. A wife is bound as long as her husband is living. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to anyone she wants. Only in the Lord. But she is happier if she remains as she is, in my opinion. <clears throat> and I think that what I also have and I think that I also have the Spirit of God. Sorry about that. <clears throat> a little rough, a little rough. All right. Again, we drop down into verse 36. I read, put some emphasis in some of those previous verses just to kind of get you thinking about it. Go back and check out for, uh, uh, part 38, which we covered those very, very words. All right. Now, just for the sake of really kind of rehashing some of the context here, I want to go up to 36. In verses 36 through 38, <clears throat> excuse me, we finish this, his address of the matter of marriage and specifically those who are likely young and have reached the proper age of marriage. He assures them that whatever decision is made, whatever whether to marry or to refrain, neither is sinful. Okay? In verse 36, Paul says to the man who is engaged in particular to a virgin, that if he is concerned that his behavior towards her is improper or unseemly, that's what that word essentially translates to, uh, another word for improper, this dealing with one out of step with the social standards for decorum who is indecent, inelegant, or ungraceful for example, just as an example <clears throat> of being improper uh, 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 Genesis chapter 19 uh, where they focus on the men of Sodom and Gomorrah who were out in the city streets and who knocked violently on Lot's door that they might bring the men, of course angels who were who appeared as men out to do unseemly improper things to them so that's just an example it doesn't <clears throat> fit it's not a one-to-one -one <clears throat> my apologies i don't know why i just drank some water so you think i'd be better here i, I guess i got this air on tune this down a little bit hit me directly maybe that'll help out to do unseemly things to them for further understanding it is for example Right, doing the, those things which are meant to be private, which is why the Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm all, I only chose that because of the unseemliness of it, but it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. I don't want anybody to go see. Says so only if they just do it in private, it's okay. No, homosexuality, homosexual practices, lesbian practices are completely an abomination to the Lord. So you can't. Don't do that. Don't do, don't try to use what I'm saying. To make that kind of connection because it's just an example of the unseemly part in public is what I'm what I'm doing there so a proper relationship between a man and a woman has private acts sexual acts that should be private better way to say it and not in the public but it is considered in inappropriate or improper or unseemly if that man and woman are doing those things in the public. That's what Paul is saying. He's not including homosexual or lesbian interaction. Uh, 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 some might say public acts of, of affection, but the reason why I won't go there 
is because I think that's way too too general and and he's talking definitely about things that are far more intensely and far more sexual in nature between a man and a woman so public displays of affection petting uh, uh, holding hands uh, you know kissing on the cheek things of that I don't think I don't think we can use that particular phraseology there uh, this would mean that the man is acting towards his fiance in a sexual way though they are not yet married which is the which is the key piece though they are not yet married <clears throat> if she is of marriageable age what a tremendous statement for which some both then and now attempt to normalize sexual desire towards mere children so Paul says, if she is of marriageable age. Paul was obviously aware of those who had a propensity towards dealing with mere children. Mere children. Think about that. Paul was saying that then. Then. If she is of marriageable age. Now, we cannot be dismissive of the cultural historical context of that day. In most societies, men were dominant and women, especially in some pagan societies like Corinth, uh, uh, were more likely property. Property. While Paul is not setting out to completely alter the cultural norms between men and women, this statement would offer some measure of constraint on those who favored what we would, what we would call a child for marital consideration so Paul is saying look even though you know in that time you could essentially uh, indentured servants men and women right and, and just say uh, uh, I, I'm an indentured servant my family is, is, is in indentured servitude if I have my, my my daughter is born I don't have a daughter but if I had a daughter while I was an indentured servant technically my daughter becomes the property of the person I'm working for. That's how it works. If she's born in his house, she becomes his property. I'm an indentured servant. I'm working for a certain length of time. I can make a contractual agreement because that's what an indentured servant or a bond servant was. A person under some kind of contractual, probably owed some money typically. I can make an agreement. Now, this is in the Jewish culture. But I would have to work, if you remember Jacob, to, 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 to earn the freedom of any children born in that situation. If I married one of the other slave girls or indentured servants of my master, I would have to earn or purchase her freedom. I, I know that sounds strange to those of us, especially in America, but I just I know we haven't looked at this in, in, in obviously several months now we're on chapter 11 but I want to make sure you have an understanding because since we're jumping all the way back to finish up chapter 7 of what we're looking at here let's move on uh, while Paul is, is, is again not trying to alter the cultural norms he is trying to set some protection from a biblical or, or, or Christian standpoint body of Christ standpoint in other words, we who are believers, those of you who are believers in Corinth, and as this letter would pass around to the other cities where believers were residing, hey, men, fellas, yeah, marriageable age, marriageable age, stay with me. In that time, a young woman had to have at least reached having her period or menstrual cycle before she would be considered marriageable age. Note Paul's words, and so it must be, must be. These words contextually emphasize that she must be of marriageable age, meaning she had to at the very least begun her menstrual cycle, which in that time when you, you know, and obviously women of today would know more about this than me, in terms of how cycles work and things of that nature but in that time because virgins wouldn't have been a strange thing a lot of times when you get a group of women together even a I grew up in a house with a mother and a sister uh, and was a stepfather to daughters uh, a wife of course and all this kind of thing 
sometimes their menstrual cycles would, would actually come around each other, uh, would, would be around the same time. Well, imagine a bunch of virgin girls, 12, 10, 11, 12 years old, coming in, 13, coming into their flowering, uh, and they would potentially start in and around the same time. Okay? So, so, so not going any deeper than that. I, I'll, leave, I'll leave that there. But they had to be of marital, marital age. Again, some suggesting even the likes of Mary was anywhere from 13 to 17, some, maybe, some suggesting a little older. I would think she was probably much, much closer to teen, mid-teen, because when Jesus, you know, 33 and a half years later, uh, uh, is hung on a cross, risen from the dead, she's still very much alive. She's, relatively speaking, close to him in age, close to him in age. Now, his father, likely, gone, most, most believe he had probably passed away, because the life expectancy of a Jewish man didn't have a lot of health coverage, <laughs> you know, uh, some of us know a little bit about that in America, but the, but living in Nazareth in particular, anyway, I, I, I won't get off into that. Uh, I'll, I'll start geeking out. Sorry. So, he can do what he wants. And that's what we read. Is qualified, this is verses 36, 37, 38, right? 36. He can do what he wants with her. Is qualified by the words, they can get married. Such words must be carefully explained, lest one with intent undermine or inappropriate to the text can craft out a teaching that will lead many young women into a slavery style environment seemingly justified as a biblical marriage, but far from it. But far from it. Let me go back to this because I want you to see, uh, uh, having just read it afresh, I think you ought to hear it again. 36. If any man thinks he is acting inappropriately towards the virgin he is engaged to, if she is getting beyond the usual age of marriage, because there's, relatively speaking, from starting her menstrual cycle, let's say 13 years old, to about 20-something years of age, again, because you're thinking about having children, okay? Uh, the usual age of marriage, he can do what he wants. Under what circumstance? Let me read it again. If she's getting beyond the usual age of marriage, and again, in light of having children, and he feels he should marry, he can do what he wants. He can what? Marry. Context, context, context. He is not sinning. They can get married. See? You see why context becomes so important? Because if, if, if I'm up preaching this, uh, uh, preaching something, and I make a comment and I make a reference, I, I just I hit this and go, hey, he can do what he wants. And I don't explain the context. Can you see how dangerous this would be in some communities with men who still hold to some notions that a woman is a second-class citizen? That could become, very, especially if he's married, he may walk away going, see, the pastor said I can do what I want. And that is not what Paul meant at all. Anyway, verse 37. In verse 37, he addresses those men on the other side of the coin who are also a engaged but not married. Who are engaged but not married. Standing firm in his heart can also be understood as talking about one who is fixed on a purpose in both will and character. That's verse 37. Paul actually defines in the context, is what he says in verse 37 context, who is under no compulsion but has control over his own will. Now again, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 37, he is talking about a young man who is engaged to a woman, likely a virgin, like they're both likely young, uh, we say unlikely because it doesn't absolutely have to be, but if we understand historical, cultural circumstances, this is potentially a young couple. And Paul, in his apostolic role, is offering some, he's giving some clear advice. Because remember verse 25, again, that's why I read it. Look, this is not necessarily coming from the Lord. 
Therefore, it's not a definitive command from Jesus, but from one of the pillars who was called by Jesus to establish the church. Okay? And it, and it is through or by way of his self-control, especially over his sexual self, that he resolves to remain engaged only and not to consummate the marriage sexually. So Paul is saying in 37, to the man who has gone through the betrothal process like Mary and Joseph, to the, through the betrothal process, that word is, you know, they are betrothed or engaged. Now in that time, once you become betrothed, you've gone, paid the diaries, you've done all that, you are in, in some sense considered married, you just haven't had sex yet. You haven't consummated. Now, I don't. I, I explained all this when we were. I, I was working through Matthew uh, on the Journey Church fa uh, Facebook page. But at the at the sake of not necessarily walking back through all of that from a Jewish culture in particular, but from that first century culture, once you got engaged, unlike now, you get engaged, you still live separately, etc. But in that time, you would get engaged, and like Mary and Joseph you would live in the same domicile. No, you weren't sleeping together. See, I gotta be clear because I understand I live in 21st century. You're not having sexual relations. Joseph and Mary were living together, separate rooms, but more than likely separate rooms, but not having sexual relations because the Bible clearly says they, he, she had not known a man. She did not have sex. So that was not abnormal in our day and time. <laughs> More than likely, if you, 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 are, you are engaged and living together, you probably have already had relations anyway. So he's saying if that person, this man, has his virgin fiance, noting, noting they're living together, and he's not under any compulsion, he, he can control himself, he can control himself, he doesn't, need, he doesn't feel any drive to try to lay with her to try to have relations, then he's saying, look, you can do what you choose to do. Because you're not sinning in that. Remember, sin is the key thing here. You're not sinning. Sex outside of marriage is sin, right? So they're engaged. They are patrolled. They're not married in the sense of officially. And I know that because I'm, I'm dealing with 21st century thinkers but trying to help you understand first century reality. So, you haven't consummated, you are under control, he's telling the man in verse 27, you're good. You're good. Don't have sex with her. You can choose to stay engaged. That makes sense. Again, recall that in that day to be engaged or patrolled, which is what I just explained, was as close to what we know marriage to be today with sex as the only thing missing. In verse 38, and in verse 38, it consistent step with what we know the Pauline style is. He summarizes his point from verse 36 and 37. And he summarizes it in 38. So then, he who marries his virgin does well. He who marries his virgin does well. That's 38, right? Again, there is no sin in getting married during the perilous time of the first century, even to one who is a virgin. There's no sin in that. Again, you got to go back to our previous parts to see that teaching. But he who does, here's the rest of 38, but he who does not marry will do better. Nonetheless, the times are such that no, that not choosing to get married, even though you are already engaged, and that to a virgin, from Paul's spiritually informed perspective, let me say that again, from Paul's spiritually informed perspective, is a better or more useful or more serviceable thing to do. Let me back up. 
is a better or more useful or more serviceable thing to do. When Pastor Gabe, in the first century, when the perilous times are coming, and we know culminating in the destruction of the second temple of Solomon in 7 AD 70. We know some suggesting, Joseph is suggesting potentially upwards of a million Jews, including some Christians, in other words, even non-Jews, suffered persecution. As a matter of fact, it actually went well up into the second century, if my history serves me correctly. The Roman Empire, until it was conquered, was still killing Jews, still killing believers. Okay? So Paul is saying, given the circumstance, the perilousness, the trial, that's why I read 25 through, because I wanted you to hear talking about the difficulty of the times. Paul focuses his attention upon the woman who is married. A wife is bound also as long as her husband is living, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to anyone she wants only in the Lord. Again, we have another verse of scripture that has been grossly mishandled by, if nothing else, taking it out of its context. This verse has been often used to condemn widows and those who are estranged from their husbands even after many years. Now why I miss these verses, I have to apologize again. I have no idea. I already finished the, the notes. I just didn't teach it. Nothing has changed from before. The moment a husband and wife separate from one another, they are counted as divorced even though the laws of the land say to them they are married but merely separated. Now, I'm really stressing this in the first century and 21st, 20th century and 21st century because, of course, I have come across many couples who are separated and keep classifying a Christian separated and classifying themselves as married. And they are classifying themselves as married from God's perspective when in fact that is a law of the land classification. That is not a biblical classification. Now, understand, you can't break the law of the land. So if you go, well, the Bible says, because we are separated, we're divorced, I can get remarried. Yeah, but not the law of the land. The law of the land requires that you get a writ of divorce so don't try to use scripture to tell California, Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, etc., etc. Well, I'm Christian. And as a Christian, it says that when my husband walked out or when my wife left, that's it. We were divorced. Technically, biblically speaking, yes. However, and I've taught all this before through chapter 7, but let me just stress it again since Paul is reiterating it. I want to make sure you want Paul is recapping according to the laws of the land, whatever state you live in or whatever country you live in, don't play that game. Don't do that. Don't go. Pastor Gabe said that, the, no, according to God, when you parted ways, you were done. I'm not going back to that old teaching. You have to just go back on the YouTube channel, Victory in Christ, broadcasting channel on YouTube, and catch that teaching. Chapter 7, it's, 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 it's illustrated there. It's, it's clearly described there so you know what you're looking for. Uh, uh, but again, so no, he is speaking to a wife who is, in the classical sense, married to and living with her husband. I want to make sure you get this. So who is Paul talking about? Who is Paul talking to? He's talking not to a woman who, who her and her husband have parted ways, which means you're divorced. Which means you're separated, you're divorced. The marriage is over. Without a writ or not. No. He's talking to those who are physically married and who are married and physically living together. Clearly. In fact, that is not his focus at all. Is bound is translated from the Greek term deo. 
and deals with the legal responsibilities of. Uh huh. In other words, Paul is reiterating that those women who are married must be sure to maintain their wifely duties and responsibilities towards their husband until he dies. They are bound or under obligation to do so. One such obligation already presented earlier was that of sex, but certainly would have to include much more. So what is he saying? As long as your husband is alive, as long as you're married, you have an obligation, you have to maintain the obligations, the traditional obligations as established in that time and going forward. For Christian women, you have to maintain the husband's alive. In other words, just because it's perilous times, are you seeing it? Just because the difficult times are coming, just because there's going to be distresses, just because there's going to be all kind of evils that's going to happen and did did actually happen, you don't get to go, well, I'm going to act like a widow. You see it? I'm going to act like a widow and act like a virgin who's not engaged. No, 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 no. You're married. And even though the times are going to get difficult, even though the times are going to be stressful, even though the times are going to be dangerous, you still have to be married and continue to do those things that married women do. You have to meet our spot. That's all he's saying. No. He was still addressing some of the concerns that had been brought to his attention. It is quite possible that some husbands and wives were having disputation over whether a wife could relieve herself of her marital obligations to her husband. Now, I'm doing this because it's not just context, 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 but it's also cultural, historical, geographical, right? Linguistical. No, the emphatic nature of Paul's words, a wife is bound, is. She has to maintain her wifely duties. Note as well, a wife, not a woman who is divorced, i.e. separated, in fact, what separates her from him is death, according to the text. And when he has died, she is, in all respects, single and can marry to anyone she wants. Let me do that again. Note as well, a wife, not simply a woman. Again, the word woman is being understood by the context as wife. Who is divorced or separated? Not talking about that woman. Talking straight to a woman who, in fact, what, separate, what will separate that woman who is married is death, according to the text. And when he has died, she is categorically no longer married. She now is called widow. Right? So she is single in all respects. And therefore, there is no condemnation. There is no sin for that widow to marry who she wants. He flat out said that. And that, he says, should be only in the Lord, which is to say, as one who is in spiritual fellowship or union with Christ. This only pertains to the Christian woman. So there are pagan women in the first century Corinth, as well as other, other, other cities in the Roman Greco world. And he's saying, this is as un, one who is of the Lord. I'm talking to those who are of the Lord. Don't try to go out and enforce this with a non-Christian woman. Or man for that matter. Therefore, she is free to get remarried to whom she will as one acknowledging her relationship with Christ as well and seeks to please him, Christ, as she walks through the relationship development towards marriage. So in other words, 
a gentleman approaches her and says, I like you, according you, I would like to marry you. And she is to engage in that courtship, engage in that potential marital situation as always respecting the Lord and her relationship with the Lord. She is not to sacrifice her relationship with the Lord for the sake of getting married. Now, there's a lot in that. Contact me if you want more detail. It is also likely that for those whose husbands had died, there was a need to clarify that she was no longer required to act as one still married. Again, remember, there is a set of circumstances that's going on for which Paul is addressing. Some, even in our day and time, have felt the guilt and condemnation of those bequeathed the death, bequeathed the dead, who would attempt to shame the widow from moving on as if she dishonors what was in seeking what can be. And I know that sounds strange, but believe it or not, when I was a kid and it came into teenage years, I actually can vaguely remember widows, widows, not divorcees. Divorcees got it a lot too, but widows, you know, particularly by family members, but, but widows who were being spoken to as if to say, you can't move on. You were married to, you know, Brother Jenkins for 50 years. Now she's 70 and she wants to move on. Maybe she would like to get married again, but she was being treated in a way, I know that sounds crazy, but being treated in such a way as to suggest she couldn't move on. And there were many who believed that and just said, okay, I'll be seen. And, and end up living 20 years. Maybe, she, maybe her husband died when she was 50. She ended up living 40 years. She didn't die till 90. Never married again. And it wasn't because she was going to serve the Lord exclusively. She may have wanted to remarry, but she was under a cloud of condemnation and guilt. I know that sounds crazy, but believe it or not, that's the truth. As, as consistent deliberator, he argues the other end in verse 40. But she is happier if she remains as she is, in my opinion. And I think that what I also have, that I also have the Spirit of God. Paul has not hesitated throughout this portion of his address to encourage singlehood. He is unapologetic in his constant re reaffirmation, stay single men, women, young, old, if at all possible, don't get married. At least right now, given the situation in the first century. Now, did people get married? Of course they did. But Paul is saying, if you can, if you can refrain, if you can abstain, and if you go back to verse five, I, 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 I don't quote me on that. But he talked about look, if you just, if you, it's better to marry than to burn. You may have some issues of self-control. Get married, but if you can control it, notice what he said later on to the virgin male, or to the man who is espoused or bequeathed, uh, a bequeathed, excuse me, betrothed to a virgin woman. Hey, man, if you can maintain, you know, just stay engaged. Just stay engaged. Now, you can get married. It's not a sin. <laughs> but stay single uh, in some sense. Uh, I, I say or write this as an opinion, but one as coming from one filled with and led by the Holy Spirit. We allude to this verse several weeks ago. We, well, now months ago. Alluded to this verse several months ago and will not belabor the point already made and thusly substantiated. Paul, and a matter of fact, I just made it a few minutes ago, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, was a spiritual pillar of the church. 
called upon to speak to matters that had no precedence before it before it so that clarity could be given and a standard could be established we question not that we question not that it is his opinion but recognize who chose him and empowered him to give it simply meaning we don't it is recommended we not go back and go well who is Paul that Paul can say all of this Paul is the apostle chosen outside of time outside of the time when the other apostles were chosen Paul is we again we covered all this through the first seven chapters so I'm not going to belabor it I'm actually done uh, 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 Paul is the one on the road to Damascus who Jesus Christ himself self appeared in the glory in his glory so glorious in fact that it knocked Paul down from his donkey as well as his traveling companions Paul the only one being able to see Jesus said Lord who are you and Jesus revealed himself and said there's something I want you to do what did he want Paul to do exactly what we are covering through Corinthians is to be a pillar set upon Jesus who is the rock who is the standard and that's what Paul does so when Paul says in verse 25 this is not from the Lord but this is what I'm saying he then he he, he did capstones it in verse 40 by saying look I, this, this 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 may not be from Jesus but I'm led by the Holy Spirit and obviously I'm an apostle now let me say this I've said it before let me say it again be careful be cautious I know there are people dubbing themselves apostles in the modern day there is no apostolic ministry like it unto those 12 and if you want to count Matthias fine 13 but there is no apostolic ministry likened unto them there are no apostolic pillars the church was established in the first century and we must leave it as that they can refer to themselves as uh, you know apostles I'm not gonna argue that it is what it is but are they apostles of the first order in the first century no no they are not pillars they are not pillars they may be pillars in their community they may be pillars among but they can be call themselves pastors and be that they may have long-standing ministries and be classified as wise classified as powerful influential but they are still not establishing the body of Christ they may be prolific writers they may be people who have written many books, but they are, none of their writings are going to end up in the canon of Scripture. The canon is closed. The body of Christ has existed for nearly 2,000 years. So with all due respect to current day apostles, they are not of the Apostle Paul, Peter, James, John, or Solomon. They did not see Christ directly. They did not. I don't care if they say, but I had a vision. No, they did not, they were not eyewitnesses to Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, that's one of the key things. And Paul literally stood talking or knelt talking to Jesus. To the man, not a vision. Remember, others were there. Others saw the glorious light. He saw Jesus. It wasn't no vision. It was Jesus in a glorious light. So, uh, I had to throw that in because of how Paul ends, or how, how that chapter ends. All right, so we, we made up chapter 7. We'll get it downloaded uh, from Facebook and uploaded into, we'll leave it up on our Facebook uh, channel uh, uh, for at least a week. But we're going to get it over to the YouTube uh, uh, ch page, YouTube channel. And so, be, 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 be uh, able, you'll be able to share it there. You can't really share out from the group because this is a private group, and that's just to keep people from coming, posting all kind of uh, uh, interesting things. All right, brothers and sisters, we appreciate your patience during this time. Uh, we'll be back, hopefully, caught up if, if, if Facebook works with me, and we'll have we'll be all the way caught up through. We may even be able to get the live the the, the stream yard up 
to where we're just posting. We're broadcasting live on both our YouTube channel and Facebook, and then we don't have to download, upload, download, upload. So uh, we're hoping to get that done really over the next about a month and a half. So be praying for us. I'll pop on and I'll be I'll let you know I'm doing chapter eight or chapter nine or chapter ten and, and I'm doing part so and so and so and, and we'll read the scriptures so you know exactly what portion that we're working on. Love you, bless you, have a great rest of the day.